Great. So welcome everyone. I'm um, sorry for a couple of technical difficulties at the beginning. I'm Jessica Bell, Deputy Director of the State Energy and Environmental Impact Center at NYU. We're so glad to have you join us today and I want to extend a warm welcome and thanks to our speakers and moderator today, as well as our wonderful State Impact Center staff for pulling this event together. We'll have time for questions, so please use the Q&A feature throughout the event as things come up. As a housekeeping note, we have been approved for an hour and a half of CLE credit through New York State. If you wish to get CLE, please listen for any codes that we'll announce partway through the event and then fill out the evaluation that we'll link to at the end and send out in the, um, in the thank you email, which will also be the affirmation form. Slide two, please. Now I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speakers. We have Katie Mapes, our moderator, a partner at Spiegel and McDiarmid, where she represents a variety of public sector clients on energy matters. Katie advises clients on rate making and market design issues, particularly in the California ISO. She has extensive experience in both settlement negotiations and litigation at FERC. Prior to joining Spiegel, Katie worked as a law clerk for the Honorable Rosalind O. Silver, federal district judge for the District of Arizona. Katie received a BA from University of California, Berkeley and graduated cum laude from Harvard Law School. Alex Klass is a distinguished McKnight University professor at the University of Minnesota Law School, where she teaches and writes in the areas of energy law, environmental law, natural resources law, tort law, and property law. Her recent scholarly work published in many of the nation's leading law journals addresses regulatory challenges to integrating more renewable energy into the nation's electric grid, transportation electrification, oil and gas transportation infrastructure, and the use of eminent domain for electric transmission lines and pipelines. Prior to her teaching career, Alex was a partner at Dorsey and Whitney LLP in Minneapolis. She clerked for the Honorable Barbara B. Crabb, Chief Judge of the U.S. District Court for the Western District of Wisconsin. Alex holds a BA from the University of Michigan and a JD from the University of Wisconsin. We're also joined by Jennifer Murphy, the Director of Energy Policy and Senior Counsel for the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners, or NARU. She oversees NARU's energy policy development and handles NARU's energy-related legal and policy work before FERC, other federal agencies, and the federal courts. She's a member of the association's senior management team and counsel for the National Regulatory Research Institute, NARUC's research arm. Jennifer's previous energy and environmental policy experience includes working in federal and state government and across the three branches of government, as well as with NGOs. She holds a law degree from Vermont Law School, master's degrees in international studies and in marine affairs from the University of Washington, and a bachelor's degree from Tufts University. Next, we have Liz Salerno, the lead for transmission and technology initiatives for Chairman Richard Glick at FERC. She has more than 15 years of experience in the energy industry across the government, private, and nonprofit sectors. And she joined FERC in 2018 as part of now Chairman Glick's team. Liz previously served as a technical advisor to the chairman, focusing on central and Western markets, PERPA, and facilitating new technologies such as energy storage and distributed energy resources. Prior to her time at FERC, Liz was the Global Head of Strategy for the Wind Energy Service Group at Siemens and was the Head of Industry Data and Policy Analysis at the American Wind Energy Association. Liz earned a Master's of Public Policy from George Washington University and a BA in Economics from Boston University. Noah Shaw is a partner at Foley Hoods Energy and Climate Practice, where he provides guidance on the legal, regulatory, and policy issues that make up the renewable energy economy landscape. He concentrates on renewable energy project development, contracting, acquisition, sustainable, sustainable development, and clean technology practices. Noah was previously general counsel and secretary of the board of directors at the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, or NYSERDA. He is also a former US Department of Energy legal advisor. Noah received his JD from Northeastern University and a BA from Brandeis. I also want to note that Noah is a member of the State Impact Center's advisory council for which we are very grateful. And we have Gabe Tabak, Counsel at American Clean Power Association, where he represents the clean energy industry before a range of federal and state agencies, courts, and legislatures. Prior to joining ACP, Gabe worked on behalf of a range of energy industry clients in private practice. He's a graduate of the University of Michigan Law School and Wesleyan University. I'm excited for the stellar lineup of speakers. Thank you all for joining us. Again, please feel free to put questions in the Q&A box for our Q&A at the end. And now I'll turn it over to Liz to give an overview of FERC's advance notice of proposed rulemaking. Uh, thank you, Jessica and Katie and the State Impact Center for the invitation to join today's event. Um, I'm really pleased to be here. 
uh, as most FERC speakers have to say at the beginning, uh, I have to provide the caveat that I only speak for myself today. The views I express don't reflect the views of the commission, uh, any commissioners or commission staff. Um, so the, the request to, was to get into sort of what the ANOPER um, is doing to sort of provide a backdrop for today's conversation. Um, and usually I find a good way to start the conversation on the ANOPER or transmission in general is just to uh, level set with, with FERC's authority of um, sort of how we set rules and regulations when it comes to transmission. So under the Federal Power Act, our authority is really limited to whether the transmission rates for service are just and reasonable and not unduly discriminatory or preferential. So all of our rules and regulations and what we're talking about inside of the ANOPER uh, really have to roll back into that authority as it relates to transmission rates. Um, given this authority, the rules to date, um, as, as known under Order 1000, have really focused on two areas, uh, regional transmission planning and cost allocation for that transmission um, as both impact uh, transmission rates. Um, order number 1000, which set these rules, did a number of things, um, but one of the primary things it did is it required each transmission provider uh, to participate in a regional transmission planning process that produces a plan. Um, and so really that's the basis for, for the reform that we're talking about. Um, order 1000, uh, it was issued 10 years ago and a lot has changed since then. And it's really time, probably past time for reform given everything that's happening. Uh, the electricity sector, it's transforming. The generation is shifting from uh, fleets that are near population centers to resources that are just located further from those load centers. Um, we obviously have seen wind and solar and storage uh, growth um, uh, be staggering over, over the last years. Um, this change means the type of resources that are trying to interconnect to the grid, um, they just have different characteristics than the resources of the past. And it's just creating a different set of demands uh, for the transmission system and what type of transmission we're gonna need going ahead. Um, there's, there's lots of, I think, facts you can point to, to, to to show this point and to demonstrate this. One, of course, is the interconnection queues. Um, they're they're jam-packed across the country. Um, not only are they primarily made up of renewables and storage and hybrid projects, but just the sheer magnitude of what's in the queue. I think it's uh, over 750,000 megawatts right now based on the, some of the latest data from the labs. Um, we know all this isn't gonna get built, but it's a, it's a pretty good indication of what's coming down the pike. Um, so with, with that backdrop and with all of those changes, it's really um, time to consider potentially a more forward-looking approach uh, to how we plan and cost allocate uh, transmission in this country. So that's sort of the backdrop that led us up to what we kicked off in July of 2021 at the commission meeting, um, where we issued the advanced notice of proposed rulemaking, um, really seeking comment. Um, it, it's a very early stage uh, step in the process. You know, we don't always use this advanced notice of proposed rulemaking tool in the toolbox, but um, there are a lot of questions to cover and a lot of issues to tackle. And so we started with that process in July to get some stakeholder feedback on the reforms um, that we're considering. Um, so moving to the ANOPER, that, that's sort of the backdrop to, to, to how we got to July and getting the ANOPER out the door. Um, for those of you that have seen the ANOPER, read it or, or heard about it, it, it covers a lot of ground. And I, and I think we're well aware of that. Um, but really that's just indicative of the task we have in front of us. Um, the, the future just is gonna look very different than the past and we have a lot of reforms to think about. Uh, but to make it simple, um, or I guess to try to simplify it, uh, I think the ANOPER can be boiled down into three areas of major reform. Um, first, the ANOPER considers reforms to the long, a longer term regional transmission planning and cost allocation process that starts to take into account comprehensive forecasts for future transmission needs, including transmission needs that are gonna be needed for anticipated generation. Um, so really a forward looking head approach, which is different than today. 
Uh, next, the ANOPA uh, has, a, has a section seeking feedback on rethinking the cost responsibility for that transmission infrastructure. And, and I say infrastructure because it means both the transmission lines that may come out of a regional transmission planning process, but also those large uh, transmission network upgrades that might get identified during an interconnection queue process. And so it's rethinking who should be responsible um, for the costs associated with all of that transmission infrastructure. Uh, finally, the, the ANOPA um, acknowledges that, you know, there's going to be a lot of transmission investment going down the road under sort of any scenario, reforms or otherwise, and the ANOPA explores whether some enhanced oversight is needed to ensure that the transmission ratepayers are not facing uh, excessive costs, again, linking back to, to our authority on just and reasonable rates. Um, so within each of these three areas, uh, there, there's, there's a lot of questions in the ANOPA, and, and I'm happy to, to get into any specific area of interest during the Q&A. Um, but I just wanted to, to dig a bit deeper um, on two items for, for this group and, and then turn it back to, to Katie to get into the Q&A. Um, the first piece, the planning piece, um, as I sort of mentioned, the existing transmission planning process as required under our current rules just may not sufficiently um, do enough forward-looking and proactive planning for the future. Um, because of that, the way we're planning for future generation, um, almost by default, is done sort of on a project-by-project -project basis or, or group of projects through the interconnection queue. Projects move through the queue or groups of projects move through that interconnection queue, upgrades get identified, costs get assigned, and then either the project moves forward or it doesn't. So you can imagine how sort of that step-by-step uh, -step approach maybe isn't the most, or you know, a particularly cost-effective or efficient way to build out the grid and may result in sort of a piecemeal, inefficient approach to getting the, the grid built out. So as a result of this, I think the concern is the status quo um, could be leading to a result that's ultimately more expensive um, for ratepayers than an approach that's a, a little bit more forward-looking and proactive um, in planning the grid. Um, so that's sort of the, the, the gist of the ANOPA and what it's exploring. Uh, the one other area I want to I want to just highlight, and then, and then I'll turn it back to Katie, is um, when we're planning for that type of transmission, that forward-looking transmission. Um, the ANOPA also wants to rethink, you know, what are the benefits of that transmission, and who are the beneficiaries of that transmission. Um, there may be a broader scope of benefits that the commission needs to be considering, um, and a broader set of beneficiaries. Um, when thinking about um, who's receiving the benefits of that new infrastructure. And so the, the ANOPA sort of goes through a, a set of questions to, to try to get us some guidance on, on a direction to go when it comes to who are, who's benefiting uh, from the transmission and ultimately who should be responsible for, um, for those costs. So that, that's sort of the, in a nutshell, um, the, the ANOPA, there's, there's a lot more to it. Uh, but I think that that's the general, the general map, um, and, and I'm happy to uh, answer any specific questions digging in further. But um, sort of with that overview, I'll, I'll turn it back to, to Katie. Uh, thanks so much, Liz. I think we all appreciate having, having you here to give us that and your views on this panel. Um, I want to start off uh, by giving our other speakers a chance to react to Liz's presentation, but also to the ANOPA as a whole. And um, in particular, I'd, I'd like to know, for you, what does a holistic approach to transmission look like? And what are the key stakeholders that need to be involved? And Jennifer, I know your group has been doing a lot on this, so I'd like to call on you first. Great, thank you very much. And thank you for having me here today. I also have to make a similar disclaimer to Liz um, about not speaking on not just one commission, but uh, 50 plus commissions across the country. So I'm not speaking on behalf of any of them or any individual commissioners, unless I specifically say it's neighborhood policy. So with that out of the way, yes, there is so much to cover in the ANOPA. 
Um, it's, I think it's really great that uh, FERC started with an A-NOPER and not just a NOPER. I think this is really inviting and it shows kind of like an, an open approach to looking at this more holistically. They put everything out there and they're asking about all of it. So many questions. Um, and so I think two things I want to focus on for a holistic approach to transmission, because you have to kind of cut it down somehow, um, is who should be involved in the process and what and how projects are considered. So looking at the who first, um, in addition to working with the traditional stakeholders, FERC really should um, reach out and engage more with the states. Uh, of course, I mean the public utility commissions, the PUCs, but I'm also talking about governors um, and state energy offices, consumer advocates, and even state legislatures in some case. Those are the people who are setting some of the policy goals um, that need to be met through transition uh, transmission planning. Uh, I know this has been done in the past, but I think there needs to be a more comprehensive look at how we're doing this. And I also think for at least the PUCs, we wanna be involved earlier in the process. I think this has multiple benefits. This allows states, I'm uh, sorry, stakeholders and FERC to understand what the goals are and where states are driving to and why. But it also allows um, the PUCs to become more comfortable with what's going on. And in fact, like using the example of modeling, it will allow them to know what the inputs are, what the assumptions being made are, where the data is coming from. And if states are more comfortable with the inputs, then they're definitely gonna be more comfortable with the outcomes. And I think that will save um, you know, consternation and, and uh, concern later in, this, in the stages. Um, and then turning to you know, uh, the how and what they're looking at, Another aspect would be to examine which projects are considered and how they're characterized. The ANOPER, for example, asks specifically whether transmission needs are inappropriately siloed into categories of reliability, economic considerations, and public policy requirements. A holistic approach would look at the impact of siloing on planning and cost allocation and whether better outcomes could be achieved if the needs were not divided this way. I think this is a real opportunity to examine how we've approached things in the past and look at whether it's worked. Um, additionally, a holistic approach would also consider alternative transmission solutions, including grid enhancing technologies and non-transmission technologies in the regional planning process. I know some of this is done, but I think there needs to be more focus on this. There's so much to cover, but I will uh, leave it there and um, turn it over to the other panelists. Or back to you, Katie. I think you're on mute. I am. You think by now I would know how to handle that. Um, Gabe, could you give us a few thoughts from your perspective? Sure. Uh, th thanks very much to, to the State Impact uh, Center for, for hosting this event. And um, I think uh, Liz and Jennifer really teed up uh, my comments on this question uh, really well. So I don't think I have too much to add. I think that to Jennifer's point, um, a holistic, when I, when I hear uh, holistic um, transmission planning, Really, what what that comes down to is uh, yes, breaking down the silos of Order One Thousand, um, which again were economic reliability and public policy projects, with the possible exception of the single state markets in um, the New York ISO in California. Public policy, in particular, um, has sort of been a, a stepchild of the uh, various categories, and it has proven extremely difficult to get any public policy projects. Um, actually uh, constructed and cost allocated. Um, and I think that piece actually links well to the other key players. And again, to echo Jennifer's point, interaction with the states. Part of the, the goal here should be to really take the, uh, the various state renewable energy uh, goals and fully incorporate those into the transmission planning process as really a, um, a starting point and an input to assume that these, these are valid state policies that need to be met and will be attained and to look at what the least cost means of getting to those state goals are with a transmission plan that also addresses the economic and um, reliability needs as well. So breaking down those silos and, and also making sure that the, the state role in their, their energy policies are fully reflected in transmission planning uh, rather than sort of um, an exogenous point, which, which I think in, in a lot of regions they are today, where the states may have their renewable energy policy, but the regional transmission plan does not expressly uh, account for that and try to make sure that those goals are accomplished mm -hmm. consistent with the other transmission goals at the least overall cost. Uh, 
and Noah, do you have a reaction to this set of issues? Well, I think um, I think Jennifer and Gabe said it very well. I, I'm reminded of you know in New York because that's sort of my aperture um, historically, and and being involved with the public policy making around the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. Uh, um, you know, you have to make decisions about whether you're making policy based on what's feasible under the existing regulatory construct, or whether you're making policy that's aspirational and that that the regulatory construct is going to have to catch up with. Um, in New York, I mean, we've made a very thoughtful decision that we were going to do the latter. And so it's probably too long in coming, but extraordinarily uh, sort of gratifying to see the ANOPER uh, have the scope that it does uh, and, and have uh, the sort of intent to um, align the policymaking at the federal regulatory level uh, to, to, to accommodate the, the sort of aspirational goals that are happening at the state level. In terms of people who should be involved, the only set of folks that I would say I would hope engage, and you know, this is, this is as much up to them as it is anybody else, are the finance providers. Um, the, the, the risks that a system that can't deliver resources appropriately or that, uh, or that uh, it sort of includes uh, significant upfront questions regarding deliverability, curtailment, and interconnection uh, costs and processes really ends up um, getting rolled into the cost of the of the of the of the facility. Um, it either doesn't happen or it ends up being more expensive than it would otherwise. And so, understanding the capital providers' perspectives uh, with respect to de-risking these projects, um, you know, I think should be uh, paramount and important. Um, for purposes of policy making uh, and 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 cost uh, uh, considerations, clearly the generation community will will make those points. Um, it's good to have uh, the banks uh, involved also. And uh, Professor Class, I know you're coming at this from a little bit of a different angle than some of our panelists. Do you have anything to add on this? Yes, definitely. Um, first of all, I'm really glad that FERC is taking this on. I think it's very timely and very. Um, important. And I'll build on some of the earlier comments. I really do think it's important to channel the state renewable portfolio standards and, um, and clean energy standards into the planning process as public policy requirements. And, you know, at least until we have um, a federal clean energy standard or a carbon tax, I mean, these state mandates are really important and are driving, you know, a lot of the um, the, the stress on the grid and the need for more um, transmission in a lot of states. So I think uh, FERC creating a framework where RTOs and other grid planners or even a new FERC initiated planning entity that's mentioned in the ANOPER, you know, can make sure that these are drivers. And this is particularly in regions where the state standards are aggressive and where we have multiple states that have them. I also think in terms of other players um, that should be involved, I think FERC could include, you know, the Department of Energy and BLM in the planning process. Both of these federal agencies have significant federal authority with regard, um, at least potentially with regard to transmission lines, either through Section 1221 and 1222 of the Energy Policy Act of 2005 um, with regard to DOE. And then, of course, transmission lines on federal lands when it comes to BLM. So I think RTO planning processes, um, you know, can do a lot of this where RTOs exist, but maybe there needs to be a, a FERC entity to be involved where we don't have um, RTOs. And then I think this may have been mentioned earlier, but also just state entities that are engaged in grid planning and siting. Uh, like, you know, the New Mexico has a renewable transmission authority. Um, there's the new New York Office of Renewable Energy Siting. Um, California has a similar one. So thinking about not just the state agencies that are involved in clean energy mandates, but also where they exist state agencies that are involved in um, transmission siting and renewable energy siting. And I think that gets a bit onto my next question, which is that uh, over the past year, I think the question of equity has been talked about a lot more at FERC in the concept of, or in the context of the transmission grid. Um, when you think about the questions in the aid and OPER, I, I, I am hoping that you can address, or the panelists as a whole can address some of the equity considerations that you see and that FERC should be looking at. And um, 
Noah, I know you have a lot of on the ground experience in New York. If that's something you could address in that context, I think that would be really great. Well, what I'll say is that, you know, I think even the folks who um, have been thinking about this the longest are still struggling with how to actually quantify uh, the, the benefits, how to quantify um, the costs and how those should be uh, considered in, in policy making and decision making. Um, clearly in, in, in New York, for example, um, you know, there's a requirement with respect to spending that benefits uh, disadvantaged communities and, and environmental justice communities, but ongoing sort of consultations and proceedings with respect to the definitions, uh, not only with respect, not only regarding what which communities those are, but also what counts as a benefit. Um, is it reduction in emissions? Is it direct economic benefit? Is it um, you know certain kinds of jobs but not others? You know, I I hope that the that the FERC will look at those questions and consider ways to include. Uh, the costs and benefits related to advantage, uh, disadvantaged communities um, sort of being taken more account of as we as we think about our our, our planning processes uh, that will no doubt um, be important to the overall uh, acceptability of the process uh, to a broad range of stakeholders and no doubt uh, be important to um, you know members of Congress and others who are who are looking at the at the way that that things roll out so it can't hurt and it can only help. Um, and I think that FERC has some good, some good models, although perhaps not complete models uh, to, 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 uh, to reflect on um, that are happening in some of the more progressive states. Uh, Jennifer, is this something you've looked at for your work at NARIC? Uh Yes, we're just starting to talk about this as part of our um, response to the, uh, the ANOPER. Um, one of the things that the commissioners are interested in is um, they're talking about maybe um, thinking that the planning process should require clear and standardized metrics for assessing the impacts on disadvantaged communities and ensuring that the benefits flow to those communities. Um, one thing I've been thinking about personally is that we have this general consensus that we need more transmission and we need to build it fast and that we need to reach these clean energy goals. And one of the ways that people have said that is faster to do this is to use existing rights of way. And, you know, I, th I think on one hand that makes a lot of sense, but on the other hand, we already know that there's a disproportionate impact on disadvantaged communities in the siting of all infrastructure, but also energy infrastructure. And so I think that we need to be mindful of that as we move forward and that we, you know, expediency shouldn't be the only metric that we're using to evaluate, um, you know, the, benefits of such things and that we need to be specific and intentional in considering something such as, you know, are you still disadvantaging disadvantaged communities? So. Thank you for that. Uh, Professor Klaus, do you have anything to add on that? Yeah, uh, you know, first of all, I'm really glad, you know, that, that this is one of the questions and I'm glad to see that there has been just a lot more emphasis on equity issues sort of in all conversations surrounding energy. I think what's one thing that I like to think about is I think that, you know, FERC and really all other planners need to focus on the equity and environmental justice impacts of the status quo. You know, mostly we think about environmental justice impacts of new projects because we have to as part of the permitting process, as part of the environmental review process. But, you know, the equity implications of the status quo are pretty dire. Um, we still have low-income residents in New Orleans who are without power who are dying and are sick because of that lack of power, not necessarily because of the hurricane itself. Um, you know, we know that the power grid wasn't built to withstand today's more frequent and intensive storms resulting from climate change. So when we delay building transmission that can integrate more renewable energy, it means we have our old grid that has greater environmental justice impacts every day. And we continue to use the fossil fuels that are already connected with that old grid and we make the problem worse. So I guess I think about it's only through building um, new transmission lines, most of which are, many of which are not in environmental justice communities to facilitate new renewable power plants, also many of which are not in environmental justice communities. Only through doing that can we retire older fossil fuel plants that are in environmental justice communities and create a more resilient grid that benefits everyone, but most particularly environmental justice communities. So, you know, our existing background risks associated with continuing to run fossil fuel plants and make only incremental improvements to the grid 
are costs and their risks and but they already exist so in many ways they seem kind of immutable and fixed because we're used to them even if it means billions of dollars in disaster relief and lost lives and lost homes so i think a huge part of this challenge is we need to be able to describe this in a way so that the public sees the status quo as a massive cost that is greater than any amount of money we might spend on replacing our current system with a more reliable grid dominated by carbon-free electricity. That's really hard, but there's a cost story and an equity story that I think um, are consistent with each other in that regard. Yeah, you know, one thing that uh, really struck me in the ANOPER is that it gives us a chance to consider the intersection between local and regional and interregional transmission work that is something that has maybe very much occupied separate spheres over the years. Um, Gabe, I want to make sure you have a chance to answer, but I also want to call out a chat that we got from one of the audience members, which uh, notes that we have not yet talked about the intersections of ISOs. Um, so we do have single state RTOs, but um, they border other states and other regions. So that might be something to consider in future enters as well. But Gabe, I want to make sure you have a chance to address the equity issue. Sure, and I, I think Professor Class really uh, made an excellent point there regarding the, the problems with the current system. Um, to put sort of a future looking lens on it, um, I think a really key consideration on the, the equity front is ensuring um, that the transmission grid of the future ensures energy access and it does so in the most cost effective way possible. Um, when we're talking about energy access uh, in past uh, extreme weather events, such as some of the polar vor uh, vortex incidents um, in the Midwest and the East, we have seen that power flows that typically might go from uh, MISO into PJM have gone the other direction. Um, and that uh, essentially transmission provides reliability uh, because of the regional variance in weather conditions and load profiles and in generation profiles, particularly as we move to uh, more and more renewable generation on the system. Um, conversely, there have been some studies that show that particularly in uh, Texas essentially uncapped energy markets, um, the costs that in many cases will be passed through to consumers um, due to the, the state's lack of, of uh, interconnection with the uh, eastern and western interconnections, um, had there been more transmission constructed, it essentially would have paid for itself in a lot of instances based on the uh, February blackouts alone. Um, and a lot of those costs are going to be shouldered by, by Texas customers. Um, and in particular, maybe uh, uh, shouldered by lower income customers. Um, so making sure that the uh, transmission grid fully accounts for the reliability benefits of new transmission and by coordinating with the other transmission needs, we can hopefully uh, get that sort of reliability at the least overall cost um, in part by breaking down the silos so there aren't multiple types of transmission projects that are only being evaluated for a single category of benefit but are instead uh, being used as much as possible to satisfy all of the customer needs so we get to that sort of uh, equitable reliability at the least cost to, to all customers. And I think that answers a nice segue into the next question I was going to ask, which, um, which did get into the question of how we factor extreme weather events into transmission planning. Um, you know, we have half a dozen we have a half a dozen examples over the last year alone, even in the last summer. Um, and FERC has simultaneously done a technical conference on this and asked for questions that very much tie it into the ANOPER. Um, so I would love to hear the other panelists and Gabe, if you have additional information to add on this, talk about how you think the best way to factor these extreme weather events into planning is. So I'll, I'll start with Gabe, if there's anything you wanted to add on that. Um, I think that uh, I've said most of what I, what I wanted to say on, on extreme weather, except that, uh, you know, some, th there are opportunities to also upgrade older uh, whole structures in the process when, if we are using existing rights of way, if we're uh, looking to expand uh, transmission, there's, there are opportunities where um, older uh, types of, of poles that may be more vulnerable to extreme weather can both be improved in the capacity so they can carry more, more energy um, but also built uh, more resilient as well. Uh, Jennifer, how have you been looking at how extreme weather events tie into these, this ANOPER? 
Yeah, I mean, that's something that the states are certainly concerned about, um, particularly being on the sort of front lines of having the impact. And, um, you know, no one's calling the federal regulator when their power goes out, they're calling their politicians and then they're calling the PUC. So it's something that's very um, important to our commissioners. They're part of the community. They want to be responsive. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's part of what they're trying to talk about now. It's part of what states are planning for on a larger level, not just within their energy offices and not just in the PUCs. I mean, this is something that states are grappling with for transportation and, and other sectors. So um, it has to be part of a holistic approach for states um, in many cases. But there is still a concern about, um, you know, one of the biggest challenges with the transmission grid is balancing the need to build facilities that allow for future um, growth and reliability needs, but also making sure that, uh, you know, you're still adhering to cost causation principles. I mean, some of what you and Gabe had talked about, like who is gonna pay for this and, and how are those costs gonna be allocated? That's a, that's a big concern that we're still struggling with and trying to figure out. I mean, commissioners, you know, they really need to know that something's actually gonna be built and that will be used and useful when it is built. And so that is, you know, of course, no one wants to have anyone have um, any power outages, outages and extreme weather seems to be causing more, but what is the cost of making sure no one ever goes without power? So um, not ever goes, without, whatever, how many negatives there are, but <laughs> everyone always has power, so. No, especially uh, we've seen in the last two years that losing power can have more significant impacts than we've ever seen before. Uh, Noah, do you wanna take on this question? Sure. I mean, I think um, you know, as Liz as Liz mentioned, the whole idea of the of the A number is to start um, a process to lay a, a ground lay the groundwork for long term planning. That is planning that's beyond you know whatever the interconnection request of the day happens to be, or whatever the the particular transmission line happens to be. You can't do that, you know, these days um, without considering the costs of of significant weather events and mapping uh, basically the locational value, if you will. Of the resources that are that are being proposed in, in any particular um, in any particular transaction, so you know I I don't think and Liz will correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think the ANOPER uses the word weather or storm. Um, I don't know that it's actually in there, and so query whether it should be and how that locational value um, should be calculated. The uh, I'm you know not to come back to New York, but this. We seem to be a little bit ahead of everybody else in the fights that we're having because uh, there's a large sort of spat going on between the Long Island Power Authority and the Public Service Commission with respect to who's going to pay for you know uh, a power a power grid upgrade to bring all the offshore wind from Long Island over to to New York City. Is that a benefit that accrues to um, the ratepayers of of Long Island and New York City, and therefore they should be under the state's cost principles paying 75 percent of that, or should it be? Uh, sort of um, attributed as a benefit to the entire state because it's happening as a result of the of the state's sort of public policy of, of you know setting a goal of nine gigawatts of offshore wind. Most of it happens to interconnect on Long Island, um, or will likely interconnect on Long Island. So what it, how how do you value that benefit from a from a sort of system reliability uh, point of view on Long Island? Uh, you know if you if you do not uh, uh, make these investments if you do not go sort of um, go through the process of building these upgrades. What does that mean for the system in future storm events, which you know are, are we're seeing more and more? So you know, people who are smarter than I am and spend a lot of time in spreadsheets and doing benefit cost analyses will will need to work through that. But I think the ANOPER or the NOPER when it comes out um, should be expressed about the need to to look at those costs and benefits from a weather and locational value point of view. Um, so that's what, those are sort of the thoughts that were in my mind as you all were talking. Thanks, Noah. And uh, Liz, I don't wanna put you on the spot, but is there anything you wanted to say about how FERC is viewing this as linked to extreme weather? Sure, I, I can speak sort of to the extreme weather, but also just the general, I mean, we're a lot of what we're talking about here and, and I think general conversations about are about what are the factors that you consider when you do that forward looking planning what do you need to take into account? What does really forward-looking planning mean? And it can mean a lot of different things to different, different stakeholders. And so for the extreme weather piece of this, you know, we had, we had a, a whole technical conference exploring this issue. 
um, and it, it, with, with some follow-on questions. And so we're, we're, we're laser focused sort of on, on that particular area in that proceeding and, and how all this comes together, uh, it, it, you know, unknown at this point, but, but we are exploring it through that proceeding. I think one, one thing to remember and, and the ANOVA explores this is for everything we consider and, and, and into the transmission planning process to do something forward looking and all of the interests for what should be considered, the back end of that, what comes out of that is potentially a project that then gets cost allocated and costs get allocated to transmission rate payers. And we still have to roll back up into our authority of making sure that the rates are just and reasonable. And so a lot of the questions inside the ANOPA are not just what should we consider, but can we consider that? What is the scope of what FERC is able uh, to have the transmission providers consider when doing that planning, because at some point there are some bounds um, to what's appropriate for us to consider under our authority and what's outside of that. And so we're really, we're trying to grapple with this through the ANOPA of not just what, what makes for good planning, but what, what are we able to consider in the planning, knowing that the back end of that results in cost allocation. And, and so that's a little bit of a, a challenging area for us that, that we're trying to navigate. Yeah, I think it's clear um, from the technical conferences we've seen and the and the orders come out that FERC is grappling, which we really appreciate with a lot of things right now. There's a lot on your plate. Uh, Professor Class, I wanted to see if you had anything to add on this. And I also, you know, more generally, uh, are there other big challenges on the transmission grid that you think deserve a lot of attention right now? Sure. Well, you know, on the extreme weather piece specifically, you know, part, part of, I think some of the issues FERC can deal with and some not so much because some of the extreme weather issues are really very distribution grid focused, right? And so that's going to be done much, you know, much more at a local level and figuring out, you know, how can we make, um, you know, the distribution system um, more reliable. But then on a broader scale, if we think about, well, we want to make sure that maybe regions like Texas are not isolated. Do we need a lot of high voltage transmission, um, you know, high voltage direct current transmission lines, uh, you know, uh, connecting the various interconnections? That's obviously a bigger macro issue that, you know, FERC would want to be involved um, in, you know, the planning and figuring out cost rules for that. So I think when we're talking about extreme weather specifically, it's very local, some of it's state, and then some of it is, you know, regional um, and national. Um, you know, in terms of just more general, you know, challenges with the grid, how do we add more renewable power to the grid? How do we prioritize things? I mean, one of the biggest problems is that the physical aspects of how the US electric grid has worked for decades doesn't match the regula regulatory authority for the new lines we need for a grid that's powered primarily on renewable energy or is reliable and resilient in an age of climate change. So we've, we've done a, a better job of expanding the footprint for managing the grid through regional RTOs and through NERC regional entities. So that's been a good development, but in terms of building the grid of the future with interstate long distance transmission lines designed to ship renewable power across the country, we have a regulatory regime where states, and in some cases, counties within states, hold virtually all the regulatory power. Um, and without a major shift in that regulatory authority, progress is gonna be slow. Um, I think incentives and money can help a lot if they can both flow up to the companies that are able to take on these significant projects and also flow down to the level in which regulatory authority exists so that money can be spread to all of the impacted communities that are gonna be needed to need to be convinced that these projects are in their interests. But that's really, really hard. Um, you know, it's not like building the first power line that everybody wants so they can have electricity for the first time. Everyone in all these communities across the country, they already have electricity. So why is this better electricity? Why is it worth a line across someone's ranch? And if they don't want it, they're gonna make sure their county commissioner doesn't want it and that their elected or appointed state public utility commission representative doesn't want it. So we have a regulatory regime where there's no way for any single regulator to adequately assess the benefits and the costs of any project. So having FERC be involved through grid planning that attempts to evaluate the costs of the existing grid in the face of climate change and the benefits of renewables, whether 
we're using a social cost of carbon or some other metric, I think at the very least we'll highlight this mis mismatch in terms of the physical infrastructure and the regulatory authority. Um, I think that that's just a fundamental problem that needs to get addressed. And I'm, I'm hoping that this process through the ANOPRA will at least have some of these issues rise to the, you know, to the forefront so we can get input on them and discuss them. That's, that's a really uh, interesting answer that brings up a lot of things. And, and Gabe, it looks like you have something to add. I think you might be muted. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, sorry about that. Um, Katie, going, going to um, your question on sort of what the other big issues are in, uh, on the transmission grid, I wanted to make sure we um, did discuss as well some of the um, interconnection side transmission issues. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, Liz alluded to in, in her um, overview of the ANOPR and uh, in you know, my role at, at ACP, we work with uh, members who are trying to develop a lot of clean energy. And one of the really big issues, particularly in the RTO regions, um, is the cost responsibility for network upgrades. Um, and by network upgrades, they are ultimately part of the transmission network and they are operated as transmission can lie um, entirely with uh, one or a group of um, interconnecting generators. And that can uh, result in some both um, some pretty extreme cost impacts where uh, we, in some regions we've seen areas uh, that have up to 500 kV elements that are being assigned specifically to generators. And those are extremely high voltage transmission facilities that are again operated as part of the, the, uh, the grid. Um, and also can lead to inefficiency because the ability for those uh, elements of the system to move forward is based upon the uh, assignment to a particular uh, generator or group of generators and their willingness to pay. So the, there are two elements here that I think are really uh, worth flagging. The first is the longer run one that I think we've, we've had some good discussion on already is that a, a transmission planning paradigm that fully accounts for where uh, new generation will be needed and, and incorporate state planning goals into that so that the generation and transmission will be there to um, ensure that states can meet their, their energy goals. Um, we'll ultimately plan for a lot of the things that are currently assigned as upgrades to individual generators as part of the transmission system um, full stop. The other, the other piece, uh, and that maybe a shorter term uh, item that FERC can potentially act on uh, more rapidly is to remove this participant funding paradigm um, simply because in, in my opinion, it, it may not be legally durable. We know that uh, transmission facilities have to be cost allocated in a way that is roughly commensurate with their benefits. And we also know from uh, court decisions that um, for instance, there's one in PJM where the, the DC circuit found that uh, projects that provided only I think 40 or 45% of their benefits to a single beneficiary it was uh, unjust and unreasonable to assign 100% of the cost to them. Um, and that is precisely the paradigm that's being faced right now on, on some of these interconnection uh, network upgrades. So moving past that and uh, breaking out of that paradigm um, is one area that will, uh, I think, be able to unlock a lot of uh, renewable energy deployment because it will um, improve cost certainty and over the, over the longer run, if these are really planned as part of a network system, it will reduce aggregate cost and hopefully reduce the number of total lines you need versus ones that are planned and paid for on a generator by generator basis. Now I'm muted, Professor Klaus, did you have a response to that? I did, um, I really did. I wanted to you know, sort of build on, build on that. See, I agree uh, completely. Um, because I do think they're, they're, by shifting all or most of the costs of upgrades to new generators, uh, we really are assuming that there's no cost to the status quo without the upgrade. And of course, in an age of climate change, that's not true. Um, so you can think about, well, maybe we should be allocating some of the costs of climate change to the existing users um, and see the new renewable generators who want to connect to the grid is providing benefits to the grid as a whole and to all customers by reducing the greenhouse gas emissions associated with the grid. Because as megawatts of carbon-free electricity come onto the grid, that means we can retire megawatts of carbon intensive electricity. So I guess thinking about new renewables is not just a cost on the grid, that they're a benefit 
um, and that the status quo in, in many instances actually represents a cost on the grid. So really shifting that um, focus. So really, I just wanted to sort of build on, uh, you know, build on those earlier comments. Um, before we move on, uh, Jennifer, Noah, did you have anything else to add on this question? I wanted to, I just wanted to add that I, I, I agree with everything that Professor Klass and, and Gabe have said. I also think there's an opportunity cost to not planning longer term. So for example, if you've got a few wind farms who are in the queue and there's a there's an interconnection agreement that provides for, you know, a certain sort of scope of upgrades with the TO and the and the grid operator to ensure that those those three wind farms can can deliver. And those happen to be the only projects that are in the queue at the at that particular moment. But state policymakers know that in that region, you know, there are going to be a bunch of other large generators coming online over the course of the next five, 10 years. Um, does it make sense to build that those upgrades, you know, only to the increased capacity of those three wind farms, or is it more efficient to actually plan farther ahead and build upgrades that are that are more sort of significant to accommodate some projection of what that increased capacity is going to be on a regional basis? You pay for it now instead of later. It's less expensive to do it at once. Overall, you know, you get ahead of the problem and you save money for ratepayers and and generators. Um, so th that strikes me as kind of an additional sort of question with respect to planning and cost allocation on the interconnection side, because I, frankly, I've seen that <laughs> I've seen that happen in ways that just don't make a lot of rational sense. The only other thing I'd say, I was struck by Professor Klaas's um, uh, reference to Section 1222, and then also her reference to the rancher uh, who didn't who didn't want the line built through his property. You know, I completely agree that. Um, you know, the Department of Energy, my former employer, should have a significant role in in this process. Um, in part, uh, you know, I'm, I, I, I would commend to anybody a piece that was written last December by my former colleague, Sam Walsh, who happens to be the general counsel of the Department of Energy now, and uh, and a couple other, and, and the now deputy general counsel for policy at the Department of Energy talking specifically about uh, Section 1222 authority. So that may well be um, something that we can that we can anticipate being uh, uh, more in the in the discussion going forward, and I hope that's right. And I hope that's true. Um, and I want to pause here briefly. Uh, I hope everybody has grabbed a pencil because I'm going to give you the CLE code. Um, although we will put this in the chat as well. So the CLE code for this proceeding is T. Well, not proceeding webinar TX two zero two one. I'll repeat that TX2021, but I think it's in the chat as well. But Noah, I wanna I wanna stay on you for a minute because I think um, you know, you may have just alluded to some of this, and I think you also have experience with this in New York. Um, when you're talking about working with landowners and communities that are affected by new transmission projects, what are some strategies you've seen be effective? Well, um, you know, I think building large new generation and building transmission facilities are different in some ways, but similar in others. Um, you know, some of it comes down to some of the softer stuff, um, you know, communication, um, uh, being in the community in person, uh, hiring people and having folks uh, in those communities who are from there actually uh, sort of as ambassadors and explainers to the community about what this entails and what the impacts are going to be. Um, a lot of it involves making it worth their while, frankly. Um, you know, what, what are the benefits that are going to accrue to that community of building a new infrastructure project, you know, in their backyard? Um, there should be something. Uh, it can't just be sort of a, um, uh, a process by which, you know, outsiders come in and put in a bunch of new steel and wire and then leave and and they don't get anything out of it. That's not equitable and, and it's not gonna be acceptable. So how do we think about the, the benefits to those communities um, of, of, the, of, the, of the infrastructure upgrades that are gonna be, be necessary? Um, from a regulatory and sort of legal point of view, you know, this is, there, there's a lot of toing and froing about the, the relative sort of discretion and rights with respect to these sorts of siting decisions, whether at the local level, state level, or federal, I suppose. Um, you know, I think 
unfortunately, the, 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 the lesson is that you can't leave this to ad hoc local decision making. It doesn't, it doesn't work. Um, you know, these are uh, either, these are either interstate uh, issues or certainly statewide issues that need to be, um, and, and the decisions need to be made on, a, uh, on that basis. Um, and so, you know, thinking about the, the standards for decision making, who gets to make them, I think we do have to, we have to pull that sort of up to uh, the planning level while still ensuring that the benefits that accrue to those communities are significant because there's a push and pull, you know, on that dynamic. Professor Class, is this something you've worked with in any capacity? Yeah. Yes, I mean, I've done a lot of writing on looking at, um, you know, opposition and ways to overcome, um, you know, um, uh, objections to interstate transmission lines, oil pipeline, interstate oil pipelines, interstate natural gas pipelines. Um, and also just looking at the difference between, you know, um, generation facilities versus, you know, energy transportation, whether it's a pipeline um, or, or a transmission line. So in terms of like, you know, strategies um, for working with landowners um, and communities is certainly, you know, early outreach can work sharing benefits early, not just in response to opposition. Um, you know, one, two interesting projects to compare are the Great Northern Transmission Line in Minnesota that was built, you know, to bring hydropower, hydropower down uh, from Manitoba Hydro into Minnesota Power's territory that was um, built um, and is running now. And then, of course, you've got Northern Pass and the Clean Line projects, which, uh, which didn't work out so well. And, you know, one thing that, um, um, happened with the Great Northern Transmission Line was a lot of early outreach with communities, landowners, tribes, those sorts of things before there was even a route in place. And they didn't even call it like option one, two, and three for the various routes. They used colors like orange, green, and red just to, um, to show that there wasn't sort of a, a presumptively preferred route, just sort of things like that. Um, now, clearly, it's easier for an investor-owned utility to build a line than a merchant transmission line company. Um, so that's one difference between, you know, the Great Northern on the one hand and then Northern Pass and Clean Line. Um, on the others, there's just a lot of built-in regulatory authority for an investor-owned utility. You already have customers. You're already known in the communities. Um, so I think, you know, that's a difference. But I do think that um, that early outreach and not just sort of making concessions once opposition arises is really important. I also do think we need to pay communities um, and both communities as a whole and landowners for transmission lines more than we do, perhaps making them investors in the project. Um, there's a lot more sort of direct payments for generation facilities like wind farms than there is for the transmission line itself, but you can't build the generation, at least renewable generation without the transmission. So I think more upfront money in that way it makes the project cost more in terms of the cost of the project, but it might it, it can save a lot of money in terms of um, reduced delays um, in litigation. And I know there's been a lot of work done in Europe um, in terms of community benefits and community partnerships, certainly around renewable energy generation. And I think um, transmission lines um, as well can also think about, um, you know, on the policy side, enhanced eminent domain authority for clean energy projects, either at the state or federal level. I mean, I, I write a lot about eminent domain authority in this context. And I guess I think about eminent domain authority as an incentive. It's like any other incentive, like a tax incentive. Um, we're basically providing an incentive to the private sector to, ha to have them build projects than at other countries, um, the government builds. Um, and so, you know, we often think about these things as being in parallel. There's a lot of eminent domain authority for um, a lot of fossil fuel transportation projects, oil pipelines, natural gas pipelines, um, less so for a lot of electric transmission lines. And, you know, I've, it's written in the past that we should perhaps be enhancing eminent domain authority for projects that are going to facilitate clean energy and reduce or eliminate um, eminent domain authority for traditional fossil fuel projects like oil pipelines and gas pipelines that have had them for a long time. Um, of course, creating eminent domain authority doesn't help in terms of landowner acceptance, but it does get projects, um, projects built. And I guess just the last thing I would say about um, differences between um, generation facilities versus transmission, um, uh, transmission lines is that with generation facilities, 
at least any project is uh, more localized. So even a wind farm that's over a big footprint, you're still generally within one or two counties and very often, almost, almost all the time within a single state. And of course, for the transmission lines um, that we're talking about building, that's not true at all. They go through multiple states. So you're dealing with uh, potential landowner opposition that changes over time in perhaps three states. Um, you've got multiple counties changing their minds as to whether they want the project or don't want the project. Same with state public utility um, commissions. And so certainly you saw that um, uh, applied uh, with the clean line projects. And I think uh, Russell Gold in his book, Superpower, does a nice job of detailing that. Um, but so, you know, any issues you would have uh, with regard to landowner concerns on a generation project are just multiplied when we're talking about um, a multi-state um, uh, transmission line. Thanks. That was a, a really helpful answer. And I think one thing that you said that resonated for me is the differences between an incumbent utility building a line and a merchant transmission operator building a line. You know, one thing the A. Noper has asked us is, about the role of competitive solicitations and whether those should be increased. And it seems like that's something we should be giving thought to as well. How can we make sure that a project chosen at a competitive solicitation is also the community as part of that process? Um, that, that brings up a lot of interesting things, but I wanna make sure we're running a little uh, late. Uh, I wanna make sure we get to a couple of other things. And one of them, uh, on the topic of FERC having a lot on its plate, uh, FERC recently announced the first meeting of the Joint Federal State Task Force on Electric Transmission. So I'd love to hear the panelists talk a bit about what they see as the role of that. Um, and Jennifer, I'll start with you. Great, thank you. Yes, we're very excited about the uh, first of its kind, uh, we're calling it the FERC Neighbor Task Force. Um, and uh, we are, you know, the. The purpose of this was to establish a formal structure to jointly explore transmission related issues, particularly planning and cost allocation. I mean, in the past, FERC and NARUC have commissioners have tried to have conversations. We used to do this thing at NARUC, predated me, but it was called FERC Church. And then we ran into issues of um, ex parte and such. And so, you know, we th we're really supportive of this way of having a more formal mechanism to avoid some of those constraints so that we can have an open dialogue and, you know, and have people, it's, it's open meeting. So people will be able to stake, other stakeholders will be able to participate or not participate directly, but at least observe and learn what's going on. It's not happening behind closed doors. Um, and I think, you know, from our point of view, we're looking for the, um, to develop a common understanding of the issues and sort of be you know, like a common foundation and for states in particular to share their experiences in a way that will inform the process to produce better results. I mean, we sort of it, commissioner, um, for commissioner Mark Christie had talked about, um, he'd used a paraphrase of a Winston Churchill quote about how it's better to talk, talk, talk than fight, fight, fight. And, you know, we have had some disagreements with FERC over jurisdictional issues and such. And I really welcome this opportunity for us to talk about issues ahead of time before it becomes a noper and such. I mean, ideally, I would have liked a little more time for the task force to get going before they <laughs> launched the ANOPER, but that's just me personally, as someone who's trying to coordinate our response to that. I think we could have talked about things generally before um, the ANOPER was unleashed, but I completely understand why FERC's on the path that it's on. And, you know, we are trying to be supportive and engaged with them um, and, and be as useful as we can in this process. Um, we're having our first meeting on November 10th um, in the afternoon. And, you know, we're really looking forward to that. And um, we're hoping that we can, <laughs> there's a lot of issues. Uh, my members want to talk about everything. So uh, we're going to work with the other task force members uh, to sort of narrow that down. Um, Liz and I are working together to come up with an uh, agenda that, um, you know, that the task force members will participate in developing. And it's just, there's a lot to talk about and we just sort of need to pace ourselves, I think. Ken, I, is there anything on the agenda you can give us a sneak peek of, sneak peek of at this point? Uh, I am not gonna say anything. I will let Liz <laughs> decide if there's anything that can be said. Um, we are sort of, they have stricter rules than we do about what can be said, so. Not to put you on the spot, Liz, but 
Well, well I'll, I'll pipe up. I mean, first, I want to echo, I think, Jennifer's excitement about the, the task force. Um, you know, it, it was it was great to get it launched, but, you know, taking a step back when we first started to think about transmission reform, right, This is there's been a call for this for a really long time in terms of reform, and when we started to think about what should we do and what's the plan, I think one of the first conversations we had was the need to be fully engaged with the states to do this properly. And I saw a question or a comment in the in the chat box here, I think along those lines. And, and I think our thinking was similar. Um, you know, it, transmission cannot be something that we kind of sit behind our doors inside of FERC and come up with a way to do it and then and then spit it out, uh, you know, through a NOPER. And, and that was one of the ideas of the ANOPER to figure out, are we on the right path? Are we thinking about the right things? But then having a direct and formal conversation with the, with the states and what trying to under for us trying to understand what it what is it that this the states would like to see out of that reform and what's going to make it work from the state perspective because at the end of the day this is a jurisdictional split right we FERC has jurisdiction states have jurisdiction transmission gets built when when sort of every everyone works together and, and we can get it through both sides of our processes when it, it's either planning and paying for or permitting. Um, the transmission, there's just, you know, there's a role for both sides. And so this is now the forum um, to, to hash some of this out. Um, and and I, I won't get out ahead on the agenda because at the end of the day, uh, the, the way it's gonna work is it's the task force members who will decide uh, what the agenda will be for the first meeting, but uh, stay tuned. Uh, we do have to publish, um, this was in our order, we do have to publish the agenda ahead of the meeting so it will be known. Um, and we received some really helpful comments in the docket already on what the agenda should be. And so we're just working through it. The task force members um, ultimately have to sort of weigh in and, and figure out what they want to talk about. And we'll get it published, but um, really looking forward to November 10th. It's on my calendar. I'm looking forward to it as well. Um, the other panelists, do any of you want to throw out a topic for the agenda? Uh, I, I would say um, speed. Uh, you know, I, I don't mean to be flipped here, but um, time is of the essence. You know, there are projects, generation and transmission, that are trying to figure out how to how to execute contracts, how to get how to get financed. Um, and frankly, the issues that Liz and the other members of the FERC staff so charitably and diplomatically wrote may be problems in the ANOPER are big problems um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Like in my phone calls all day, every day. And so, you know, while I understand, and as a former state policymaker, I completely get it. Uh, you got to go through the steps, and you have to build consensus, and you have to make sure everybody's, you know, on the boat. Um, you know, you also need to be paddling as quickly as you possibly can. So, uh, this this stuff is urgent, um, both from a sort of economic point of view and from a climate point of view. And I just hope that uh, that, that that is sort of driving the driving the the, the timeframes at every step. Professor Klaus? Yeah, I'm really happy that FERC is moving forward with the uh, with the task force. And you know, one one issue to talk about um, would be, you know, is there any common ground on FERC playing a role in helping build um, transmission lines through federal siting authority or otherwise? And if it is, it should be explored. Um, you know, what you know, what's state input on ways that FERC and DOE um, should use its should or could use its authority under section 1221 and 1222 of the Energy Policy Act in a way that provides for state partnerships. Um, or do state PUCs have ideas for partnerships or state compacts that make FERC and DOE exercising that authority unnecessary? You know, the one other um, issue relating to the task force is I did note that you know states are represented exclusively by PUC commissioners. Whereas most state public policy requirements on clean energy transition are being initiated and implemented by other state agencies. So I would wanna make sure that those voices are heard as well. Um, also, is there a role for local governments um, within that um, that have relevant public policy requirements that will also require transmission expansion? And then I guess last, you know, should there be a role for BLM and DOE to address um, transmission lines crossing federal lands and that um, EPAC uh, 2005 authority. Um, 
obviously the, the BLM role is very important um, in the West um, and also, um, uh, and, and of course DOE nationwide. So I would wanna make sure that those voices are heard um, as well. I would just very, very briefly add to the, the excellent comments on the, the panel. Looping back to my uh, earlier comments about the need to sort of um, break down the silos of different transmission categories, I would hope that the, the task force is able to work on some of the ways to actually uh, get um, state policy goals incorporated into transmission planning. And that that's one of, one of the areas that hopefully can feed directly into the ANO proceeding or, or proceedings in terms of proposed rules that come out of this is to use uh, the, the record developed on the uh, FERC NARU panel to figure out the best ways to make sure that uh, public policy is sort of on a co-equal footing and is being optimized along with the other drivers of transmission needs. Thank you all. Um, oh, Jennifer? Yes, I just wanna, I mean, we understand that this process needs to happen quickly. And, you know, I was sort of joking about the fact that the ANOPR came out at the same time as the task force, but, you know, in our, our conversations with FERC, you know, we understand that they're pushing forward with this and that these two processes may seem to be running in parallel, but they're really going to um, feed into each other. And it's, it's supposed to create a, a better process overall. Um, you know, it's, it's, we're not as confined by the, um, strict, you know, there's going to be technical conferences that one was just announced and such, but this is just another way to do it. And I think, you know, things like a technical conference is a way to bring in some of the other stakeholders, but there really is a, we'd like to think, a unique relationship between FERC and the state commissions that they, they need their own time to talk. And, and I think this is a good way to, um, to achieve some of that. So I don't know, if, Liz, if you want to add anything to that, but. I think that's exactly right. I mean, I mean, the, the I don't remember who sort of mentioned it. I mean, there, there's sort of a, a an element of speed here of, you know, probably this is reform that's long overdue and, and we, we know we have to get going. And uh, there's a lot of things to tackle in terms of the scope of the ANOPR, but making sure we're doing it um, in a smart way. And, and I think having the state task force stood up and kind of running by on the side, you know, sort of in parallel with, with the reforms that FERC is thinking about it, it's incredibly helpful to us. I, I'm hoping, you know, given we haven't had our first meeting, but that can feed into the process and it kind of keeps a check on us and to make sure that, that we're doing this in a way that's going to make sense because at the end of the day, the goal is getting the transmission plan paid for and built. Um, and so we can do a speedy process and not sort of consult folks and, and get to a finish line quicker, but maybe it's not the right outcome. And I think what we've set up here, the hope is that we, we get to a, a fast outcome, but also uh, the right outcome that, that really results in actual infrastructure getting the ground. And um, with that, I think uh, as a practitioner, I'll say, given the need for speed, I still appreciated the uh, extension on the deadline for reply comments. Thank you, Noper. Um, I want to, I don't want to cut this short, but I do want to make sure we have time for some audience Q&A. And we have some questions already in the Q&A of the chat. So if folks have other questions, please feel free to type those into the chat now. But I'll start, I want to ask one of the questions we got is whether there's a role for FERC's Office of Public Participation uh, to play in advancing stakeholder engagement on regional transmission, transmission planning. And um, so I'd love to hear if there are thoughts on that. Um, and and Liz, I don't know if that's something you could take the first crack at. Sure, happy to happy to to respond to that. You know, so we're we're, we're getting this office of public participation. It was established. It's it's getting stood up. Um, we're sort of still building it um, in the moment. But I think you know, this is the exactly the the intent of the office, right? It's a place for stakeholders, especially stakeholders who don't regularly practice before FERC. It's a place to um, understand the issue and get engaged and figure out a role to play if, if they're interested in a certain proceeding. Um, you know, it's not always the easiest to navigate how to get yourself involved um, in a proceeding. So I, I think the intent of the Office of Public Participation is, is a great place to get involved, um, or at least understand how to get involved in a proceeding like the ANOPR to the extent, you know, stakeholders have an interest in, in how this reform plays out. Um, 
I'm curious if any of the other panelists have thought about um, as an ideal matter, how would you like to see the Office of Public Participation get involved in this set of issues? Okay. Well, we can uh, we can move on to the next question. I um I know that there's a bit of a learning curve. Um, in terms of filing at FERC and participating at FERC and understanding the acronyms even. So um, I'm, I'm excited about the potential of having an office out there that can help folks who are not seasoned practitioners get into that, that realm. Um, let's see, we have a couple of other questions. Um, and one is, uh, what level of focus do you expect to see put on upgrades that increase utilization of existing lines in the near term while longer term system expansion projects are developed. So I think that gets back into that interplay between different levels of transmission planning. Um, does anybody does anybody want to take the first crack at this game? Sure. Um, that's, that's an excellent question and one that I think FERC is, is looking at in, on a couple of levels right now. Um, there is both a proposed rule out there on dynamic line rating, which uh, depending on how it's adopted, or I should say line, line rating enhancements that includes uh, dynamic line rating in some instances, which is uh, one technology or, or a suite of technologies that will uh, potentially more accurately reflect real-time conditions and allow for better utilization of existing lines. There is the transmission incentives proceeding, which, with, which had an excellent uh, technical conference a week ago regarding um, uh, innovative ways of uh, accounting for the benefits and paying for grid enhancing technologies. Um, and I think that that's one that we're extremely interested in seeing. And I think there is a, definitely a connection to the ANOPER as well, um, where um, there should hopefully be opportunities in um, both the transmission planning and interconnection context to make full use of available technologies to ensure that the transmission that's built is really being safely and accurately maximized. Um, that's a way to, to allow more projects uh, to operate. Um, it's a way to uh, reduce congestion and curtailment to the greatest extent possible. And these technologies to the benefit of uh, being fairly cheap relative to building new lines. So making sure that when we build, we are, we're maximizing the use of what's out there is really key on, on a number of levels. Um, let's... I mean, I echo everything Gabe, Gabe just said, and, and there's, a, there's sort of a lot going on right now from the perspective of not just taking one step back. We need new infrastructure and we need to better utilize the existing system, right? We, there is so much happening that we have to do, we have to do both. Um, so the ANOVA is really about, you know, new infrastructure, but of course the regional planning process could identify upgrades to a system um, if, if that was, if that was an outcome of that, of that study process. But in terms of utilizing the existing system better, um, we do have the proceedings Gabe mentioned open and, and we have to remember there is a, there's an umbrella that, uh, of, we are required by Congress um, to incentivize the increased use of, of the existing system to improve efficiency of the existing system. And that's not really an incentive we have in place right now, um, even though we're required to have it. And that that is why we were pressing through the technical conference earlier, I guess it was last week, um, we, we dug into that, uh, trying to figure out what is, what's the right way to incentivize um, increased use of the existing system because it's uh, a good concept, but we're, we're struggling, I think, a little bit with, with what's the right way to do it um, and the best way to incentivize better utilization. Um, but I just wanted to provide that framing that we are we are required by Congress to, to have those incentives in place. Thanks for that, Liz. I, you know, one thing I think I've seen in my practice is that there's a lot of local work that flies under the radar and doesn't necessarily get incorporated into the uh, assumptions made in the larger planning processes. And I think one thing I'm interested in seeing is more coordination between all of that. Um, I'm gonna take one last question before we do a wrapping up. Um, and this is something I was hoping somebody would ask about, which is, do the panelists have thoughts on the proposal to establish an independent transmission monitor? Anybody, anybody wanna take a first crack at that, uh, Professor Klaas? Yeah, I mean, I think it, I think it's something that definitely needs to be discussed. Um, and it, is, it probably makes sense in a lot of different um, contexts, you know, so 
One, you know, one area that I guess I see it would be really fruitful, and I think I may have mentioned this in some of my earlier comments, is in the parts of the country that don't have RTO. I don't know what it would look like there, but um, you know, in the in the where, where we have regional RTOs, at least there's already that regional planning built in. It's done in a way that sort of FERC is overseeing. Um, and you know, there's a whole process for that. I think that's probably that's less developed where um, in the parts of the country that we don't have RTOs. And I think so. That's an area where, you know, FERC may need to um, do more in terms of you know creating a forum in that way through through some sort of um, independent transmission monitor. But I think there's an important role for it too potentially in um, in RTO areas. So I think it's a fruitful area of inquiry, and I'm going to be really interested to see. Um, how that how that develops, but I think it's important. Anyone else? Okay. Well, oh, Jennifer. I just want to add much, but we are definitely talking about that issue. I just don't know whether we'll reach consensus on that issue. <laughs> it's definitely something we're thinking about and talking about. Well, I want to make sure everybody has a minute to wrap up. Um, so I'm going to go go around and ask everybody to give some concluding thoughts. Um, and when you're doing that, you can enter the lottery. What what order number do you think FERC will or should give any order resulting in this proceeding? And Liz, I know you might be recused from that. Um, but uh, but in general, for wrapping up, Liz, can we start with you? Sure, I'll uh, I'll abstain from the uh, the order number. Um, but I'll be interested in what others have to say. I, I think for, for final remarks, um, you know, I think I just want to acknowledge, I guess, two, two, two things. First, you know, we know that ANOPER is a lot, we know we have a lot going on um, and, and we understand we're asking a lot of the stakeholders in terms of engagement. Um, so we're, we are aware of that, but we're also trying to balance that with, with trying to make some progress and, and um, moving ahead and getting these reforms. Because even once we resolve you know, what we think we want to do and get it out in a proposed rulemaking, then we need to process that and then get it to a final rule and then get everyone to comply with that final rule, right? There's a lot of regulatory steps in front of us before those rules are actually in place and resulting in transmission. Um, and so we, we are aware of that and trying to sort of plan ahead accordingly. So we appreciate sort of the amount of effort that I think the stakeholders just have to engage with us to, to make this happen and, and are aware. So thank you. And thanks for your work on this and for being here today. Uh, Jennifer? Okay, so I don't have a guess as to the number. I just have a plea that it not be 2020, 2021, or even 2022. I think we're tired of those numbers. I think they might conjure up bad memories when we're working on this. God, we're still be working on transmission issues 10 years from now, but so that's just my plea. Please don't do that to us. <laughs> um, and. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, and I just want to thank the State Impact Center again for inviting me to participate. Um, I think it's a really exciting time to be involved in transmission issues. And I think it's important for people to be involved, including the listeners on the call here or in the, watching the webinar. Um, you know, there are, there are multiple ways to get involved. You can submit comments, you can participate in the um, technical conference, you can talk to your state commissioners. But I, I mean, I think these issues are really thorny and really difficult and nobody is perfect answers yet and we need everyone thinking about them and, and working on them. So, and that I would just say, but also keep in mind, this is a marathon, not a sprint, no matter how fast we wanna go, it's gonna be a long slog. So in a good way, I guess, but yes. Um, Gabe? Sure, I will go far beyond my uh, competency as an energy lawyer here and, and throw out the number of uh, 1035. Um, and the reason for that uh, it actually is tied back to it um, uh, is that the ANOPER ties together so many threads that I've started thinking about it as sort of a unified field theory of interconnection, transmission planning, and cost allocation. That what comes out of this, it may, it may take several, the form of several different proposed rules or final rules, but ideally there's an integrated process that really, uh, again, takes account of all the, the drivers of transmission all the benefits, all the trend, all the beneficiaries, and where the um, uh, future of generation is headed, um, as well as state policies. So that's sort of the unified field theory, and, and very quickly looking at this, 
10 to the 35th power. It has something to do with the life of a proton in physics unified field theory. Um, so for, for taking random numbers here, that's mine. Uh, Noah? Well, I'm not going to take the bait on a number, um, <laughs> but I will. I, I love Gabe's answer. It's my, um, it's, it, I had a similar, although slightly less um, technocratic <laughs> way of thinking about the waterfront that you're trying to, uh, that you're trying to, to cover here. It, it is truly extraordinary. And I think, um, you know, the, the policymakers in the space and the advocates and the, and the generation uh, developers and financers are all looking at this and thinking, oh, you know, okay, we have a pathway, or at least there's a playing field. Um, uh, and that is a huge step forward and uh, something to be uh, for which you, Liz and, and, and Miles and the rest of the staff should be, should be really be commended. Um, I, I think I'll leave it at that. I don't, I don't wanna go on too long, but thank you to the State Impact Center uh, for, for, for bringing transmission to the, to the top of the sort of um, list of things to talk about, at least for today. It is super te technical and nerdy, um, but you know, for all those people out there who care about climate change, it's it's the biggest thing that we're going to have to deal with, at least in our in the electricity system um, over the course of the next, you know, five years. Oh, you're mute, Katie. Oh, I was just trying to say, Professor Class. Okay. Oh, uh, in terms of an order number, I would say either 2030 or 2035, just because these seem to be like the target dates for when big things have to happen or should be happening. So that that that, that would be mine. Um, and just in terms of last thoughts, I think there's a real opportunity here for FERC to be able to give some guidance um, about um, state public policy requirements and, and how those should be used. Um, through transmission planning, um, I just think th those that, that's changed so much in the last, you know, since Order 1000 in terms of the role that um, state clean energy standards and renewable portfolio standards have have played in terms of just driving investment and driving um, utility commitments, uh, voluntary commitments as well, and how that um, how, you know how that is then going to drive what we need to do on the electric grid. So I think you know because of those significant changes, now is a real opportunity for FERC to you know, help RTOs and others figure out how to integrate those into the planning process. Well, thank you everybody so much. I think that's just about time. So I'll turn it off back to Jessica for any last. Yes, um, that is time. I just wanna thank everyone for attending. Please see the chat for a link to the CLE affirmation and evaluation form where you'll put in that code. Um, the link should be working right now. Thanks for your patience. And we appreciate any feedback you have. And last, a really big thank you to Katie and our panelists for a really, really interesting discussion today. Thanks all. Thanks everybody.